Mm, so I'm very happy to uh, share with you that I found um, a translator uh, for Chinese uh, for the Bodhijayawatara uh, waiting uh, who joins us here has been convinced to help. Um, we'll go a month at a time. Um, also the Portuguese and the Spanish um, <laughs> will we'll go as much as we can. Mm. So this will be very helpful because especially a friend, uh, a Chinese friend who lives in Seattle reached out and said that she knows of uh, a good number of people in mainland China that would like to participate uh, and receive the teachings on Bodhicharya And so if we can translate, have a translator for that, it will be uh, good. So, so that's good. Um, very happy. Thank you so much, Waiting. So uh, now we are at statement 15 of the Vajra statement. Now, briefly, statement 14, right? It says the three bodies remain undifferentiated. The three bodies, meaning the Nirmana Kaya, Samboga Kaya, Dharma Kaya. So another translation would be the three Kayas, they, they reside, they abide together without any separation, without any distinction. And then another statement, right? It says, you know, uh, mm, if uh, that uh, if Buddhas do not achieve Buddhahood uh, throughout, uh, if 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 a, a, if a sentient being's attainment of Buddhahood, right, isn't attained uh, throughout all space and time. But just limited to some place at some time. Uh, like if, even like we think of Buddha Shakyamuni, oh, limited to Bodh Gaya, yeah, where he attained Buddhahood, oh, 2,500 years ago. Uh, yes, of course, you know, on the relative level, uh, that's true. But don't think that, you know, Buddha Shakyamuni's uh, enlightenment is limited to that. Uh, then by extension, oh, Buddha Amitabha, you know, limited to Western Pure Land, Sukhavati at a certain time. Uh, if we think like that, you know, then Gilbert Rinpoche says, if Buddhahood is limited to a particular place at a particular time, then it's not Buddhahood. Yeah. Then also we are reminded, you know, Buddha's activities arise due to causes. This is necessary to be reminded of that because again, sometimes some sutras or some tantras might say things like, oh, it's causeless. Especially like in Vajrayana, we like to use word like, you know, spontaneously arising, right? You, you come across that expression, right? A lot. Spontaneously arising, spontaneously arising. As if, you know, no rhyme or reason. Poop. <laughs> spontaneously. Uh, so it's easy sometimes to get carried away by that kind of language and forget. No, 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 no. <laughs> it still means causes and conditions. Uh, it still means, you know, somebody created those causes. And then it means for us, you know, we need to make the right choices. Not always possible, for sure, at least at this point, because we are still under the power of confusion. And then by extension, we are still being dragged around by the afflictive emotions. But... The fact remains to the degree, to the extent that we make the right decisions, so to say, you know, <laughs> or make 
the skillful choices, then the desired results will come. Including Buddhas manifest, appear, not without cause. Then we looked at, you know, what are the causes? Well, they are relative bodhicitta in their two aspects, aspiration and engagement. And how aspiration and engagement is related to the arising of the Nirmanakayas and the Sambhogakaya. So all these statements, you know, in this chapter, though, you know, as I said, it's, it's sometimes hard for us to see what, what this is. And then including it says, you know, Buddha's mind, Buddha's, uh, this, the Buddha's mind or Buddha's mind can go even to the extent of covering the view of the eternalist and the nihilist. Right? There's another statement like that, which is quite radical because constantly we are told these are the two extreme positions uh, and the middle way is free from these two extremes. But here Kyopar Rinpoche says, you know, even, even the extreme views of the outsiders, when we have a, a bigger view and bigger understanding, we can see that even that is not beyond Buddhas. The Buddhas can even know how to use those views to guide beings along the path to awakening. So here, you know, you, you really get, you know, up to this point, statement 14, right? how amazing and how wonderful right, this state of Buddha is. And how our concepts of it isn't it, but nonetheless, as long as we still have to work with concepts, we should try to have more skillful concepts about what this end result is. And this end result should not be understood as an, a, a state of blankness. This end result should not be understood as, you know, uh, a state where cause and effect uh, uh, is, is like uh, contradicted. Yeah. And then finally, statement 15 is uh, in a way like, whether Sherab Jhune intended it or not, and probably he did, you can say that statement 15 is like the final exclamation point. The final point, the finale that takes brings it home. How does it bring it home? Oh, this statement. All Buddhas dwell in the natural continuum of all sentient beings. All Buddhas are present in all of us. Wow. <laughs> Nowhere else. So people claim that all the Buddhas dwell in Akanishta or in similar places, meaning uh, Sukhavati, you know, Abhirati, uh, or even, you know, the mm, Voucher Peak in India, or Bodh Gaya, yeah, or some holy place, some sacred, you know. Yes, relatively, you can say all of that, you know. If you go to Lapchi, you can experience Milarepa's blessings. If you go to Bodh Gaya, you can connect with Buddha Shakyamuni's blessings, so on and so forth, right? Uh, Guru Rinpoche is in the Copper Colored Mountain, Pure Land. Uh, Avalokiteshvara is in Potalaka, so on and so forth. But all those are skillful means. All those are relative. The ultimate is all Buddhas dwell in the natural continuum. That means in our natural minds, in the minds of, in the hearts of all sentient beings. So now, Chodra, 
starting from the first cultivation of the resolve for awakening, um, bodhicitta, all Buddhas perform the conduct of awakening. So they carried out the deeds of awakening, uh, bodhicarya. So the title bodhicarya, avatara. Uh, avatara is to enter, uh, to go into. So there's another word, use of the word avatara in the Hindu tradition. It refers to how Vishnu, uh, God uh, in that system, enters into our world in the form of what they call the 10 avatars of Vishnu. So that notion of entering. But in the title, Bodhicaya Avatara, is not about God entering, but how we enter into Bodhicharya. Charya is conduct or deeds. Bodhi is awakening. So on the path, what are we doing on the path? On the path, again, we are performing. We are embodying the conduct of awakening. Achieve Gnosis and turn the wheel of Dharma. Moreover, since apart from causing the benefit of sentient beings, through keeping the teachings alive and all the other activities, they, Buddhas, engage in nothing else. And in fact, they do not dwell in the sphere of peace, which is the Hinayana notion of Buddhahood. Uh, that Buddhas, when they achieve Buddhahood, you know, they 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 have checked out. <laughs> they have uh, they have checked out of samsara, and now they are in the sphere of peace. Here it says, no, no, no. Uh, the essence of Buddhas is working for the benefit of others. The Buddha Anusmriti refers to that which is other than the sphere of peace, the natural continuum of sentient beings in samsara. Buddhas do not exist in nirvana. They exist within the confines of total completeness. They dwell in the place where they perceive all sentient beings. And how can they perceive all sentient beings? They perceive all sentient beings because they are all sentient beings. Now, the reckoning of the measure of the space of the Buddha's dwelling is not like the example of space of a needle's eye. But if you ask, how do all the Tathagatas fit into the mental continuum of each and every being? <laughs> so some literalists uh, want to say, uh, how can all the Buddhas that exist fit in the mind of a particular being? Uh, Maitreya Nata replies, since the perfect Buddha's body emanates everywhere, since true reality is inseparable from the mental continuum of sentient beings, and since beings possess this, this, this element, this family, this, this gene, I think family, what's often translated as family, um, really what it's talking about is having the stuff, uh, what we would call in, in, in modern right, language, gene. Do you have the Buddha genes? <laughs> so, uh, so here, you know, possess the genes. All who have bodies always have the essence of the Buddha. From an early commentary of this passage, since the Buddha's gnosis exists within all beings, since the undefiled nature of the Buddha and the beings is non-dual, and since the term result is metaphorical for the Buddha gene, it is taught that all beings possess the essence of the Buddha. Question, how does Gnosis exist? How does it appear? Answer, these beings have the natural characteristic of the five Buddhas. They appear like a supreme dancer and an excellent painting. Whatever is called great bliss is only a single thing. The single thing is turned into many aspects. This is to say that like the supreme dancer and the excellent painting, they can illustrate many, many postures, positions, right? So sometimes we call it great bliss, which is none other than the realization, perfect realization of insubstantiality, no self, emptiness. 
And this single realization manifests in many ways. Concerning that, the Buddha is dwelling in one's natural continuum since beginningless time. He is dwelling as one who possesses the two complete purities. Maitreya Nata further said, while the afflictions of the sentient beings element that shroud true reality are from beginningless time unconnected with beings. The undefiled nature of the mind is said to be connected with them since beginningless time. So whereas the afflictions are by definition a mistake uh, and temporary, uh, the Buddha nature is the essence, is the nature of beings. Since the impediments of karma, mental afflictions, and knowledge objects obstruct this nature, they are just things one must remove. And so it quotes the Hevaja Tantra. Since sentient beings are Buddhas, but are veiled by adventitious defilements. If one removes these, that is Buddha. Okay, the, I, I should point out, you know, there, there is a problem that um, could potentially be introduced when we're reading it in English. Yeah? Uh, in English, we have to make choices to say, over here we say Buddha or the Buddha. Over there we say Buddhas in the plural. And then elsewhere, we say Buddha in a more abstract sense. Yeah, In the Tibetan, in the Sanskrit, you know, they are all indistinguishable. So this is the translators, you know, having to make choices. Yeah? Here plural, here, you know, um, uh, uh, singular, uh, here more as a person, here more as a concept, right? Certainly, uh, the way they're expressed, you know, also even, even in Tibetan or in uh, Sanskrit um, or Pali, uh, you can say, okay, here it has more a sense of a specific person. Here it has a sense of more uh, the, the, the quality of being awake. Uh, but the language in the language, in the words themselves, they, they are not distinguished. So here, sentient beings are the Buddha. Be careful with that, yeah? Because don't think like, you know, oh, the Buddha is like God, you know? Sentient beings are God, <laughs> like a person. It's not. Yeah? So it, it could as easily be translated as sentient beings are Buddha. Sentient beings are awake. Or sentient beings are Buddhas. Meaning every sentient being is already a Buddha already awake, but are veiled by adventitious defilements. If one removes these, that is Buddha. Buddhahood is an English problem. <laughs> In its original, it's simply, if you translate even more literally, it's just Buddha. Just like our refuge prayer when we translate, you know, in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, most excellent, I take refuge until awakening is reached, until body is reached. By the merit of generosity and other good deeds, other perfections, may I attain Buddhahood for the sake, right? Actually, in the Tibetan, it's just may I attain Buddha. May I achieve Buddha. Which further translation, may I awake. May I awaken. Which is what Buddha means. May I awaken for the benefit of beings. Hmm. So now the Buddha field is intended to exist within the natural continuum of sentient beings. However, some think that when they invite Buddhas and request them to depart, the Buddhas come here from a separate good place such as Sukhavati, Akanishta, and Abhirati. That kind of thinking is not beyond the defilement of grasping self and other as different. So during empowerments, during our practice, we say, oh, now light goes out, inviting Buddhas to come here. Actually, you know, sometimes we can get so carried away. That's why, you know, uh, we, uh, even I can say, you know, earlier on when I was teaching about these things, 
Uh, I emphasize a lot, you know, oh, you have to see light going out and then the Buddhas are all coming. But all that is just symbolic. Uh, it's reminding us that the Buddhas do not come, do not go. Uh, so that kind of thinking, uh, if you if you fixate on that, if if you become too kind of stuck on that idea, then you are not beyond the defilement of grasping. That the pure lands, hells and so forth are nothing but the embodiment of virtue and non-virtue and not separate places was taught by Shantideva. Who made the ground a burning iron? And from where did those demonic women of the hell realms come? The sage declared that all such things are just projections from your evil mind. Now, again, I want to footnote here and say, now, not don't don't turn this into like like pop psychology, yeah. or like uh, in the over interpreting of saying, oh yeah, these are all just symbolic. Hell realm is symbolic. Animal realm is symbolic. Uh, hungry ghost realm is symbolic. See, here it says that. But here it also says, this is also symbolic. <laughs> Eight Ridge Street, you know, where I give as my address is also symbolic. But am I able to experience Eight Ridge Street and this body as symbolic? Yeah, this almost 51-year-old body is symbolic. No. When I have pains, oh. When I have pleasure, ooh. When the house, you know, is clean, oh. When the house is messy, oh. <laughs> Likewise, yeah, hell realms, Buddha realms, they are also real to the degree this is real. But they are also not real to the degree that this is not real. And so that's an important footnote yeah? because often yeah, these passages are taken out of context for us. In Shantideva's context, there's no mistaken because his audience got, get it. His audience has not been told that, oh, only your human realm is real. Everything else just, uh, then when we talk about them, it, it's just to symbolize good and bad for you humans. Shantideva's audience, uh, they, they're not thinking like this. It is as the Vimalakirti Nidesha Sutra teaches, according to which Shariputra saw a field as consisting mainly of high mountains and low valleys. And so there in the Vimalakirti Nirdesha Sutra, there's an exchange between Shariputra and Vimalakirti. And basically is Shariputra showing how the mistake, Shariputra showing the mistake of thinking that, oh, the world is this way, this way, this way, this way. So in his limited way, he thinks, oh, there's high mountains, low valleys. Then Vimalakirti showed him, you know, Hey, there is another way of experiencing this uh, that is not high mountains and low valleys. The Brahman, Rabachan, who had come from the field of Buddha, uh, Ashok, Ashokotama Shri, saw it only as a place of the Paranirmitta gods. The Buddha taught his retinue that his Buddha field was similar to the field of Buddha Ratnavihya of the East, and that likewise it remains pure in all aspects. And so these are examples from sutras where you know, people thought, you know, like, oh, the world is just like this, like this, like this, and then the Buddha showed them it's not. Yeah. Furthermore, what is called the natural place. So here, uh, this natural place, yeah, uh, in, 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 a lot of Vajrayana, uh, like deity practice, uh, at the end of the visualization, then we say, 
Now may the wisdom beings go back to their natural places. There's sometimes that, that expression. So we are making a mistake if we think, you know, oh, they go somewhere. Yeah? That their natural places is like in some pure land, far, far away. Now they go back. But here it's like, no, this natural place is the natural continuum of sentient beings. The reason is that natural has the connotation of unconditioned, spontaneously achieved, and so forth. And that natural continuum of sentient beings is nothing but a name for the essence of the Sugata, which is Buddha nature. All Buddhas dwell in the natural continuum of sentient beings. The Manjushri Namasangiti states, engaging in the minds of all sentient beings, the Buddha is swift like the mind of all sentient beings. Knowing the senses and objects of all sentient beings, he enchants the minds of all sentient beings. Moreover, he is the object of the mind of sentient beings. He understands the mind of all sentient beings. He dwells within the minds of all sentient beings and all these activities engage in accordance with the mind. In short, a person is needed who is free from the defilement of grasping self and other, but those who possess dualistic grasping cannot attain complete awakening. So we have to understand that put this are nowhere else to be found but within our own minds. Awakening, in other words. The awakened state is nowhere to be found but in our own minds. Sobish gives us... So, yeah, it says, yeah, people think, oh, a certain Buddha appeared in a certain world, did a certain thing, and then they yeah, dissolve or disappear. In contrast with such a view, Jigden Sumgun maintains that all Buddhas dwell in the natural continuum of all sentient beings. So then, uh, uh, Sobish uh, gives uh, summarizes uh, Chodra's uh, commentary and says, basically Chodra is giving the following eight points. From cultivating the resolve to benefit beings onward, Buddhas engage in nothing but that, benefiting beings. Their activities are incompatible with the idea of they are dwelling in some state of peace uh, that they have checked out. Uh, so that is a wrong view. But instead, they dwell in the natural continuum of sentient beings who exist in samsara. All Tathagatas together fit into the mental continuum of each and every being since Buddha's bodies emanate everywhere. True reality is inseparable from sentient beings' mental continuum and all beings belong to the Buddha family and thus possess the essence of Buddha. Fourth, the Buddhas dwell in one's natural continuum since beginningless time means that they are the undefiled nature of the mind that is connected with being since beginningless time. Whereas the kleshas, the afflictions, are just temporarily arising and therefore not part of the natural state. Removing adventitious defilements is then what Buddhahood is. Remem removing those temporary uh, afflictive emotions is what we mean when we say Buddhahood. Buddha feels like Sukhava, Akanishta, and Abhirati exist nowhere but within the natural continuum of sentient beings. The very world into which a being is born that is the Buddha field. So this is our Buddha field. 
Look around you. That's your Buddha field. So be Buddha-like. <laughs> In fact, you know, if we really grasp this point, yeah, no need to ask, you know, and I'm go am I going to Sukhavati or not? Wherever you are, that is your Buddha field. Experience it so, make it so. The very thing that is called natural continuum is so-called because it is unconditioned, spontaneously achieved, and so forth. Yeah? And it is a synonym for Buddha nature. Now, Sobish points out, and this is important, in the Dorshema and Rinjangma, uh, they also tie in uh, a teaching about disciplined conduct, about shila, about morality, what we call morality. They state that all the Buddha activities actually exist within the individual natural uh, continua of all beings. Right? So, yeah, so that's the basic point then. If a person engages in bad conduct, not only do all ordinary beings perceive his wrongdoing, but all the Tathagatas, through their pure gnosis perception, perceive that as well. On the other hand, if a person behaves with correct conduct of body, speech, and mind, this is the very entrance gate for Buddha activities and blessings. So if, when we engage in unskillful actions, you know, so to say our Buddha mind is a witness to that. And in a way, Buddha mind will remind us that is not who you are. That is not what you are. Time to wake up. And this is your Buddha field. Make it so. So the true way to celebrate uh, Earth Day, uh, which is yesterday, <laughs> the true way to celebrate Earth Day uh, is to recognize uh, that this Earth uh, is our Buddha field. And this earth is our Buddha field. Now, the, for this last mm, statement, mm, I want to read from another commentary of uh, Chodra, which has been translated into English many years ago, uh, but hard to get this book. Uh, Germany, uh, the publisher, uh, they, they, they might still have this. Uh, maybe you look around. Uh, if you really want another commentary, this is the book. Yeah. Uh, you can take a screenshot of it. <laughs> and so this was translated uh, quite a few years ago. Uh, it's pretty good um, now that we have, you know, this really good translation. I can see uh, this was published in 2009 by Tara Foundation in, in Germany. Mm. So here, so, so this is a different commentary, but by Chodra as well. Uh, the... The Nimanangwa, which is this one, the light of the sun, the illumination of the sun, uh, is a prose uh, commentary. Uh, this one is a verse commentary. Uh, so shorter uh, and more pithy. Uh, it's called Munseldrome. Uh, so this uh, Munseldrome. It's like a, it's the lamp that dispel darkness. So uh, let me read to you yeah, the, the the verse commentary here. So it says this. Uh, 
uh, all Buddhas uh, reside in the mind stream uh, of beings. When it is said in the scriptures of mantra, quote, may Buddhas go to their realm, uh, go to go back to, uh, because again, in, in daily yoga practice, at the end, the solution, we say, you know, may they return to their own places. Uh, may they go back to their natural place. Uh, so when, when the mantra texts say this, then what they mean is, the element of beings, the natural state of sentient beings. May Buddhas return there. Apart from that, Buddhas do not take possession of any place. In other words, Buddha do not go anywhere else. A paraphrase from the Uttara Tantra reads, the body of the perfect Buddha emanates for all beings, it is not separate from the element of suchness. Beings have this element. Because of those three reasons, all beings possess at all times the core of a Buddha. And, another chord, all sentient beings are simply Buddhas, but covered by adventitious defilements. And this is from the, a famous quote from the Hevaja Tantra. It is called transcendence, but there nothing else exists. Yeah, meaning, uh, it's not transcendence as in Buddhas have gone somewhere. Yeah, it's right here. Uh, and not, in the sutta-related text, this is expressed as samsara and nirvana are not different. Understanding the nature of samsara is what we call nirvana. Hence, dualistic thoughts saying that a so-called Buddha is someone noble, residing in a pure Buddha field, while so-called ordinary beings are false, are vulgar, wandering in samsara. So this, this kind of dualistic thoughts, and this, this last few lines is really wonderful. This kind of ordinary thoughts are at all times from the beginning until the end harmful. <laughs> the idea that Buddha is someone noble residing in the pure Buddha field uh, and beings uh, are false, uh, vulgar, wandering in samsara. This, at all times, these types of thoughts are harmful. Sangsara and nirvana are inseparable. One's own mind is the actual Buddha. This is the same for all beings as well. The one whose mind is certain about the absolute meaning of this point will awake. Will awaken. That's the good news. <laughs> so beautify your Buddha field for others. Perceive your world as your Buddha field and be Buddha-like in your deeds, in your conduct. That's it. All the practices that we do is to be, not to become, to be more Buddha-like now. Because this is our Buddha field. This is our pure land. There is no other pure land. The exploration of Mars not very practical as a second home. <laughs> and whatever version of that also not very useful and not necessary. Mars 
is the Buddha field of Martians. <laughs> Earth is the Buddha field of Earthlings. Guatemala is the Buddha field of Guatemalans. Mexico is the Buddha field of Mexicans. Black Mountain is the Buddha field of Black Mountain Nears. <laughs> Asheville is the Buddha field of Ashevillians. <laughs> Singapore is the Buddha field of Singaporeans. Malaysians, the yeah, Buddha field is called Malaysia. Don't look for Buddha fields anywhere else. Don't look for Buddhas anywhere else or in anyone else, actually. Because all Buddhas of past, present, and future abide continuously within our own minds. <laughs> Good. Even if you don't have a Kuskanian resident card, Cusco is now your Buddha field where you stand, where you sit. That is the Buddha field. On Monday, we look at chapter one, statement one, chapter six, statement one. And in this way, we go full cycle and plant the seeds of our continuous study in one form or another of the Vajra statements, the single intention of all Buddhas the Vajra statements of Kyobajit and Sumgun. So on Monday, we will do this. Chang chum sem chorem punche Magye banang ge gyurche ge banyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong du Thank you. Okay, ta ta. Well, for now. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Muchas gracias. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Yeah.